important. Uh, so, so basically, just to give you a bit of an overview, today we're going to be discussing uh, transitioning from stills to, to video. Um, so just to give you an overview, so we'll be going to um, why it's important in, in today's world to, to be familiar with the world of video as well, um, for those who have a, a background in photography. Um, the, the, the easiness of, of technology and, and uh, how the new cameras are shaping and, uh, and affecting this, this transition as well. Um, we're going to be discussing the, the changes in terms of uh, technical, from a technical perspective, basically, um, what settings to look out for, basically, and how it, it uh, differs from, from the world of, of photography, um, including uh, the different equipment and gear required. Um, uh, yeah, and we're going to be having a look as well as the, at, the, at the workflow, both in terms of shooting, um, things to look out for when you're shooting video, um, as well as an overview of basically what it entails, edit a video and the workflow involved in post-production. Um, so yeah, as, as Charles was saying, basically I have been doing freelance filmmaking for the last couple of years. Um, and I try to juggle between the commercial and the corporate side of things on one hand and wedding filmmaking on the other. Um, and uh, I first actually started off uh, doing photography uh, when I was still studying at university, communications. Um, and then slowly I transitioned into the world of video uh, because I already had experience in the world of broadcasting. And, and uh, I, I saw this opportunity to, to di delve better into the world of video rather than photos. Um, you. If I may interrupt, we're not yes. seeing the presentation. Oh, uh, my bad. I think I haven't shared the screen yet. So. Okay, there okay. you go. Good to go now. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so basically, as I was saying, I, I work with different companies ranging from gaming companies, financial, um, learning, um, and uh, weddings as well. So private clients as well from that aspect, basically. And I try to keep two different brands, basically, just to differentiate my, my body of work. Um, so stills versus video. Um, I think it's important to understand first and foremost that video in itself is technically moving stills. So uh, basically, um, it's a, a video is actually an image sequence, um, and once you get that sort of that perspection of of looking at video as an image sequence, uh, it makes things make much more sense because it's easier to establish how similar they are to each other. Um, one of the most important terms that we'll be mentioning as well will be frame rate. So, so basically, a video uh, in in Malta and in, in the world of PAL in Europe um, will contain 25 frames per second. So we have 25 still, still images after each other, and that will make one second of video, basically. Um, this this uh, transition uh, from uh, stills to video, I think it started off um, quite, quite this, it was, it was something big sort of a couple of years back when there was the, when there was the DSLR revolution. Um, and I still remember Canon coming out with the 5D Mark II back then, um, and it had a bunch of video features. Um, and it was an important milestone in, in, this, in this transition because it was one of the first uh, full frame DSLR camera that was accessible price wise that could shoot video, which could give you more of a cinematic result because of the large sensor involved as well. Um, yeah, so basically, um, it's important as well to, to understand the different types of cameras that, that are in the market today. We're seeing a lot of mirrorless cameras, which are constantly having more video oriented features as well. Uh, so that's always a plus side as well, even though even if, if you're not that much into video, even if you're more stills oriented. Um, and we're seeing a lot of hybrid cameras as well from, from all different manufacturers. So it, it's not related to just one specific brand 
So for example, Kenyan have recently come out with the, with the R3 and the R5C, um, but even Nippon, for example, have the Z9 as well. So, so all brands are now exploring more and more the, the world of video. Um, there are obviously other cameras which are more aimed at just capturing video. Uh, so you're going to see both cinema cameras, which are usually more expensive because they're aimed at larger productions, um, as well as camcorders, uh, which are sort of more the traditional video cameras as we know them, basically, because they're aimed at capturing video, just video, um, in terms of long recording. Um, it's also, I think, one of the reasons why it's important, why the subject is important of knowing both video as well as stills, um, is that in today's world, I think these two have become, have sort of merged into one another, basically. So um, I think it, the, the most field where this is most common has been the world of photojournalism nowadays, because it's important for the journalist uh, to be able to capture video, even though he's primarily shooting stills, um, especially if, if it's somewhere, I don't know, perhaps covering uh, uh, war-torn countries or whatever, uh, similar situations, basically. Um, but but it's also important, it could be important anywhere. It's also, I think it's, it's become um, one of those skill sets that it's good to have. Uh, and if you're doing photography full-time, I think it's also worth exploring because it might be a good way of marketing yourself and differentiating yourself from your competitors. So, for example, just a quick example, I think if you're doing um, real estate photography, it might be worth exploring video as well, because you could start offering your clients perhaps like walk through videos of the property itself. So that's something worth exploring as well. So um, before going to all the ins and outs of, of video and all different features and buzzwords, um, I think it's it's important to, to mention story and, and why story is important. Um, so story is always important. I think whether you're shooting stills or video, um, having a good story um, will be the key to, to creating a visual narrative, basically. Um, and it's basically done through sequences. So basically, a sequence is defined as a series of shots connected and linked together. Um, and this is something that's actually diff rather different than photography. It's that you're not just thinking of the shot itself, but you're thinking of what comes before and afterwards in terms of shots as well. So apart from the sequence itself, apart from, from the, the different shots one after the other, um, the shot also contains different filmmaking or cinematography elements that tell the story within the shot itself. Um, and this is done through different techniques, through composition, through lighting, through camera placement and movement. Um, and uh, these elements can be, are common basically to both the world of photography as well as video. So for example, lighting and composition, I'm sure most of you will, will know the ins and outs uh, and are familiar with some of the theories behind them and how lighting works. Um, whereas there are other elements which are specific to video and that mostly is basically camera movement, for example, which we'll be discussing later on as well. So speaking of story, I think it's important uh, to brainstorm the process to come up with a story. Um, and uh, these five W's basically will help us understand uh, what this story is all about. Because when we say story, we're not just referring to uh, uh, some sort of narrative, basically, uh, where it's like uh, watching a, a film at a, at a, at a cinema. Uh, anything could have a story behind it, basically, no matter how abstract um, it is or what sort of genre the video is. So even if you're shooting just a personal video, it could still have some sort of story behind it. Um, and basically these five W's can help us understand uh, more sort of what, what we're after than the story that we can come up with. So basically just to run through this quickly, the who will relate 
to who the subject is, as well as who the audience is, who, who we're targeting, who the video will be, will be for. What is what the message, what message we want to convey with the video? Um, where relates to the location? Where does the story take place? Um, when, when does the story take place? So it could affect, uh, it could be the time of year, it could be day or night. Um, and why is the story relevant? Um, perhaps this is not as tangible, why? Um, but uh, it could help us understand how we're trying to convey this, this story that we're telling, basically. So it could help us figure out what sort of mood that we want to create with the, with the video itself. So, for example, if it's something which is more of an intimate story, we want to give it that intimate feel. It might require like smooth movement other than something which is handheld and shaky. Um, so basically, just answering the questions above will help us figuring out basically uh, what our story is all about. So speaking of cameras, so this is a topic which I'm sure most photographers will, will come across at one point in time and discuss between each other. Um, and uh, I think nowadays it's even more important that th there's no such thing as the perfect brand or the perfect camera. Um, it all depends on, on what you really do um, because all manufacturers have different brands that are aimed at different users as well. Um, so it's it's good to find out sort of what you're after and the pros and cons um, of uh, of the camera itself. Uh, so for the most part, if you're already into photography, most cameras already have good uh, video features that will get you started. Uh, but there are others, other cameras that you might want to explore as well, depending on different features. So the most important features when it comes to video, at least, will be the sensor size, but it's also important for photography as well, obviously. Uh, the resolution, frame rates, codecs, I will be discussing this later stage as well. Um, but there are also other factors that might come into play. So for example, camera size, when we're speaking about video, it's, uh, you can have different camera sizes as well. Uh, the weight, what sort of connections, if, if that's something that you require specific features that, that cameras might have, which are video oriented, uh, whether that includes like an internal and the filters, for example, we'll be discussing this at a later stage as well, and audio field and, and audio. So choosing the right tools for the job. Um, I think this is one of the major differences between photography and video is that video, when you're doing solely video, will require um, a larger kit. So it's not just having just one camera um, and uh, a couple of lenses, but you also need uh, to take into consideration support, uh, for example, tripod, monopod, but it could also be other um, equipment that we'll be mentioning at a later stage, which will give us camera motion as well, um, lighting, um, as well as audio. So, it's important, speaking of budgeting and speaking of equipment, um, it's important basically what I'm trying to say here and what the point I'm trying to, to get across is that if you, if you have a budget dedicating to buying a camera, don't just go all out basically and spend all your money on, on just the latest camera that does everything. Uh, but it's important to, to try and understand what, what sort of kit is best for what you're trying to shoot as well. So if you're shooting, I don't know, interviews, you might want to, to explore uh, having a decent lighting kit um, and a standard audio kit as well. So you'll, you'll capture clean audio. Whereas if you're shooting perhaps um, weddings, you might need um, faster lenses. So it all boils down to, to what you want to shoot. Um, in terms of budgeting and, and what equipment you need. So now we're gonna delve a bit more into the, the actual camera settings, which are different and more video oriented rather than, than, than photo oriented. Um, so we have these four key um, features that are basically different. So we've got the frame rate. So as I was mentioning beforehand, frame rate is basically 
so in you the pool shooting in 25 frames per second. So that's like our standard video. Um, anything we see on television will be in 25 frames per second. So that's like the real time speed that we're seeing. Um, other countries might use different formats. So for example, the US use a different uh, standard. They have NTSC, which requires different frame rates. Um, and you could also use higher frame rates. So for example, most cameras nowadays, uh, you'll see that they shoot 4K, 60 or 50p. Uh, and that's usually the highest frame rate that they can shoot at that specific resolution. Um, and what this means is that basically you could shoot in, so for example, 50, 50p means that you can shoot in 50 frames per second. Um, and what this allows you to do is basically it will give you twice the frames per second. So you could actually slow it down and you'll get half the speed um, if you want to explore slow motion as well. So resolution, the standard nowadays is, is basically 4K, although HD is still quite common and still quite a decent resolution. Um, 4K, obviously, even if you're not delivering video in 4K, it will give you a, a better image uh, quality to work with. Um, and it will give you more flexibility because you can even like crop um, and to a, certain, to a certain aspect, reframe as well your shots if you're still delivering in, in HD then. So picture profile, um, I'm sure you've come across this as well when you're shooting photos. Um, so you usually have like standard and natural and vivid different profiles. And to a certain extent, these also apply to video. Now, the main difference for video is that most cameras will allow you to use either a picture profile which looks decent straight out of camera. Uh, so for example, you're shooting in standard or natural. So basically the file that is saved is looks good, even if you just want to deliver that video. Or they will also allow you to, to capture um, more of a flat image. It's usually referred to as log. So different camera, different camera manufacturers will have different variations of log. So for example, Canon will have C log two or C log three. Uh, Sony have their own S log. Uh, Panasonic will have their own V log. Um, and this basically gives you the best dynamic range that the camera can capture. Uh, but the, the downside is that you'll have to grade this and, and color correct this image in post in order to make it look good when you're delivering and uploading the, the finished product. Um, lens choice. So, uh, Lens choice is basically a stylistic choice. Um, it's important, I think, to differentiate um, between stills, still lenses, and cine lenses. Um, still lenses nowadays are quite good. Um, and in fact, most uh, videographers and cinematographers, um, especially if you're shooting, unless you're shooting high budget um, commercials or or in the world of, of film as well. Um, still lenses are quite good nowadays, um, especially if we're talking about prime lenses and they can be used for video as well. Um, cine lenses, on the other hand, it's important to mention as well uh, that they're usually fully manual, so they don't give you uh, access to change the aperture in camera as well, and you'll need to use manual focus only. So you don't get autofocus, which which the normal still lenses will give you in video as well. Um, and it's also important to mention as well vintage lenses here. So as we're saying, it's lens choice can can determine what the video will look like. Um, and this is the same. This also applies to photography as well. So vintage lenses can give you that that unique filmic look that most cam cameras nowadays. Uh, because we're shooting digital, obviously, uh, can give you a bit more of a clinical and surgical feel to it, to so the video. Um, and vintage lenses can help take that edge off, basically, and give you something which is a bit more stylized. So, data. So, obviously, whether we're shooting photos or videos, our work is all about data at the end of the day. Um, but it's important to, to differentiate that uh, video requires more storage space because 
of the high data rates that at, w at which we're capturing video, basically, because we're shooting so much, basically, if we're still thinking of image sequences, we're shooting only a couple of stills every now and then, every, every, every now and then it's one thing, but if you're shooting continuous video, then it's another thing. So it's, it's something to keep in mind as well. Um, the, the storage requirements basically boil down to at what resolution you're filming. So the larger the resolution is, the more storage space will be required. Uh, the frame rate as well, um, as well as the bit rate, which is basically uh, the megabits per second at which the video is being saved. And the higher this is, basically, you're also going to require uh, faster cards as well. So nowadays, if we're talking about SD cards, uh, you're going to find that they have certain uh, specifications. So you're going to see that they're marked as V60 or V90. And this is basically just, just to certify uh, the speed that, that the card actually can, can actually write and sustain basically throughout. So if you're shooting at some of the, the, the highest quality options, uh, you might need uh, some of these cards, basically, for example, v cards. cards. Um, because of how intensive certain, certain file formats can be when we're shooting video, um, I think it's also important to mention that uh, different cameras, even hy hybrid cameras, basically nowadays, um, are sort of trying to delve away from SD cards as well. Uh, so we're seeing new cameras coming out with either CFAS or CFX rest cards, which cost an arm and a leg, but they're extremely fast. Um, so so it's sort of a compromise between between uh, uh, cost and and speed. Um, it's also important to mention as well the different uh, codecs that that the video is being saved at. So one of the key differences as well is that. When you're shooting photos, most people will, uh, at least most people who are doing photography, taking photography seriously, will prefer sticking to RAW rather than JPEG because of the flexibility it gives you in post. Um, this is a key difference from video because when you're shooting video, we're still using compressed codecs uh, mostly because of the enormous space required when you're shooting RAW. Um, and just to mention that basically a lot of cameras don't even record raw video. Very few cameras actually record raw video. Um, and when we're discussing codecs, it's basically so just like um, JPEG is basically a compressed file format in which images are saved. Um, we have different compressed codecs that are used in video. Um, so the most common formats are either H.264 or the newer generation H.265. Um, and we also have ProRes, although very few cameras um, capture directly in ProRes. So basically H.264 and H.265 are still uh, the most common codecs. One thing that I want to mention as well is that newer cameras will give you the choice usually between choosing whether you want to save in H.264 or H.265. H.265 usually gives you more flexibility um, and it takes up less space because it's it's based on newer algorithms basically. So you're still capturing the same amount of detail or even better detail, but it's taking less space. The downside is that to edit this file format, you need quite a beefy uh, PC or Mac, basically, to be able to edit it smoothly. So even if you're running on an Intel-based uh, machine, even Macs, uh, you might run into issues with with playback. Uh, so you have to render it out, basically, um, or or convert it to a different format, which which is better aimed at at editing. So shooting strategy, just something quickly that I want to mention as well. It's the importance of basically being prepared um, and and going to a shoot basically with an approach in mind. So um, just like when you're shooting photos, you don't just take photos at random if you're doing this uh, professionally. 
um, you come up with with an approach. And as we're saying, sort of, um, it's it's important to to have this in mind when when you're shooting video in particular. Um, so you just, you're gonna hear many different like pre-production techniques that that different people use when it comes to video. So some will want to storyboard their video, others will want to prepare shot lists. Um, but it's it's not only that. Basically, it's important that you're aware of all the external factors that are going to come into play when you're shooting video. Uh, so whether that's natural light, whether that's noise in terms of audio, because audio is something that, that when you're shooting photos, uh, you don't have to deal with, whereas in video, you do have to deal with that. Um, and it's important basically to be confident that you're actually adequately prepared for whatever it is that you're shooting. So sequences, as we were saying beforehand. So a sequence is basically made up of a series of shots um, of varying shot sizes. So when we're saying shot sizes, we're saying whether it's a wide shot, a medium shot, or a close-up. Uh, and there, these are basically used uh, together to create a sequence. So it's imp this is important. A sequence is important because it will help the story move forward. Um, so when we're seeing these different shots one after the other, um, it will give the audience the feeling of a story and it will help them understand how the story is progressing. It's important as well to mention here because we're dealing with different shots one after the other, the aspect of continuity. Um, so basically what continuity means is that basically it's important that whatever it is that we're shooting, we have to think of the edit in mind. We have to, to keep this in mind at all times when we're shooting. So if we want to shoot things, it's important to, to keep this aspect of continuity in mind. So that, that if you're shooting something and there's a, a specific object in shots, we don't change that object um, for, for the, the period that we're shooting, basically. Um, or, for example, if we're shooting uh, a scene and the lighting changes and you know that the shots are going to be one after the other, it will, it will look jarring, basically, to the audience and it won't portray this feeling of, of, of story, basically. Uh, so continuity is important as well. So basically, just just to to visualize this this uh, this aspect of uh, of sequences. So here, th these are a few frames uh, from a production that I've recently worked on. It's it's a corporate film, basically, and we're seeing. So first, we have an ultra wide aerial shot, a drone shot, basically, which is establishing the location. So then we're seeing the subject arriving at this building at one of the buildings which I put fade in the first shot. Um, and then we're seeing at the third shot, we're seeing where the location is particularly situation. So where the subject is actually arriving at. Um, it's important as well to, to something that I want to, to mention as well is that choosing these shots can be tied to the five W's that we mentioned earlier, the who, what, where, why, uh, you know, uh, so basically, for, so for example, the, the first shot, uh, because it's an establishing shot, it's directing the audience and helping them understand where our story takes place. You know, in this case, it's close to a marina uh, and in, in an office building. Uh, and it, it's also portraying when the story takes place. So, you know, it's nice weather. So it's probably summer or autumn um, and it's during the day. So the second, the second shot is, is giving the audience a better understanding of who. So we're dealing with, with this female, uh, female talent and uh, she's, she's a key part of the story. So the audience know uh, who the subject will be. The third location, once again, is dealing with the where once more, but this time it's more specific because we're seeing the, the building um, basically up close. Again, another different sequence from within the building this time. Uh, so we're seeing the first, the first shot is showing us where the, the scene is taking place. The second shot is telling us what she's doing basically. So she's working and or will just a typical day at work. Um, and the third shot is once again, telling us who the person is. 
So we're seeing that, that this, this sequence is giving us context when we're putting this all together. So if it had to be just one shot, it, it would be even harder to figure out what's actually happening. But when we see these three shots, one after the other, it will give the audience that feeling that this is, hey, this is actually a normal day at the office. You know, so so it, it's conveying more message, more more information to the audience than if you had to see just one shot on its own. So composition. So composing your shot is always important, just like it's important in, in photography. So the story is basically important, not just across the shots, so with, with sequences as we've we've been discussing beforehand, but also within the shot itself. So we're seeing a couple of different shots here, some different projects that I've worked on. Um, so the rule of thirds, the rule of thirds, I'm sure that most of you will be familiar with it. Uh, and it's, it makes things easier to, comp uh, to compose, to have a well composed frame actually. Uh, and it helps us understand uh, where to put the subject within the frame. Um, so in the first shot, top left, uh, we're seeing the use of negative space. Uh, second shot, uh, top right. We're seeing a bit of symmetry in play as well. Um, I'm just going through this briefly because I'm sure most of you will be will be aware um, of these techniques because they, they still apply, they still carry over from the world of photography to video as well. Um, third shot is showing us the use of, of, a, of using the shallower depth of fields to give us a bit of foreground as well uh, and creating the depth within within the image itself and the last shot is basically just a creative choice um, because basically once you know the rules uh, it means that you can actually break them basically when appropriate just to have something a bit more stylistic so it's i think i find that that usually what really helps me from a personal point of view is that basically in order to come up with with an interesting composition um, it always helps me that instead of just capturing the, the very first thing that I see I usually just say hey let me just try and recompose my shot basically so I'll just try to find an alternative than the first shot that I had in mind and this this usually means that that I have to work even harder just to get the shot but the end result will be something that I might have missed, you know, and perhaps it's not just like if you're shooting, let's say, this, this particular scene, which is shot in the US, um, it's, it would have been easier. Probably I would have just gone next to the railings, the next to the railings and, and basically captured the view as it is. But just taking a step back, a little step back in this case, and just including these kids out of focus. Um, it, it's helping us, giving us a bit more um, of a stylistic approach and giving us some more depth to, to the image. So here's another image, just again, in this case, it's literally thinking outside the box, in this case, outside the room, just taking a, a step back um, and capturing a wedding dress, a bride's dress basically from outside outside the room and it's it's more like of an establishing shot in this case. So exposure. I'm sure you, you're familiar with this as well with the concept of exposure and it's it's basically what determines how how light or dark the picture is. Um, and just like in photography, um, cameras have two modes basically. So you can either use automatic or manual. Um, manual is obviously preferred um, especially when it comes to video, because it gives you full control um, and it allows you to set your exposure, determine basically based on your on what sort of subject it is that that you're filming, as well as making creative choices when necessary. For example, shooting a silhouette. Um, in video shooting in a manual, exposure is even more important than photography because. Whereas in photography, you're capturing just one frame and that's it. In video, if you're using an automatic exposure, you're gonna see the, the exposure change within the shot itself. Um, and the end result won't be as desirable. It's, it's not something that, that's gonna be desirable because 
you might see difference or for example the depth of field might change um so it's usually the standard of just locking the exposure um, and setting the exposure manually so basically you've got the, the trifecta basically of of the shutter speeds the aperture and the iso which once again apply basically to the world of video so this is all common uh, between both photography and stills uh, but in the case of video these are uh, um, these change slightly um, so basically when it comes to shutter speed uh, the general rule is that basically we want to stick to twice the frame rate that we're shooting um, so if you're shooting in 25 frames which most of the times we are you're shooting to a, a shutter at a shutter speed of one on 50 basically um, and the reason behind this is that basically uh, the shutter speed when we're when we're referring to video affects the amount of motion blur that we get within the video within the shot itself um, the higher the shutter speed will be the the less motion blur there's going to be and the end result is that most of the time this will make the video look a bit jarring because you eliminate the the the, the, the natural motion blur completely if you stick to, to this general rule of, of sticking to twice the frame rate, it will give you the most naturally looking um, motion blur basically within the shot. ISO, the same concept in photography applies to video as well. So the lower the ISO it is, the, the cleaner the image and the less digital noise you're gonna have. Um, and it's important as well to mention that uh, most cameras or rather all cameras actually have native ISO values um, and uh, this is usually changes depending on, on the camera that's in use and this will give you the cleanest image um, and the newer cameras nowadays have, have higher native ISO values that, that are even better when shooting in, in low light as well. Aperture, so basically uh, the larger aperture will give you uh, will allow more light into onto the sensor basically um, so it's better for low light um, and it will also help you achieve a shallower depth of field which is uh, it's quite a common phenomenon nowadays to to shoot with a shallower depth of field although sometimes it can be too much um, so it's important as well to to use this appropriately based on what you're shooting as well um, so exposure tools so in video we have different tools which will help us achieve um, a good exposure basically because as we're saying it's it's um, we're dealing with with a compressed uh, file it's even more important to make sure that we actually nail exposure when we're actually shooting so over here we're seeing we're seeing some different tools that that can help us figure out a good exposure. So in the first case, we're seeing zebras basically, uh, in this case, they are set up in order to show us uh, using the zebra patterns on the sky, uh, which are telling us that the sky is actually overexposed. So we might have to dial down a bit the exposure. In the second case, we're seeing the waveform, which is, seeing, which is basically telling us a visual representation of how our image is exposed across the scene. In the third image, we're seeing false color. So false color might be a bit of a different concept, but it's basically showing us um, across the image where the, 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 how the different parts of the image are actually exposed at what values between zero and 100 they're exposed. So usually uh, you'll have the green and magenta, which is basically um, around 70%, which is where you want your skin tones to be basically. Uh, but uh, I think I want to mention as well is that very few cameras will have false color and specific video features tools um, built in. So these will probably be more often found in either cinema cameras um, or if you're using an external monitor, um, it will have that function as well. And uh, uh, the last uh, frame we're seeing a light meter as well just like it's common in photography as well, it can also be used in, in video. Um, and uh, more often than not, most uh, lighters will have video specific 
uh, modes as well that will allow you to punch in and dial in the frame rate that you're shooting at um, and the correct right. settings basically and it will be uh, basically more of a mode specifically aimed for video. So just one thing that I want to jump on is that beforehand we were discussing um, the the different the, the exposure triangle basically and the uh, setting up the shutter speed, the ISO and the aperture. And as we were discussing, um, if you paid attention, basically um, when we're setting when we're setting the, I, we were saying that basically when we're setting the shutter speed, we want to try and keep it as close to twice the frame rate as possible. So let's say we're shooting on one on fiftieth of a second. Uh, if we want to stick to the to the lowest ISO possible um, or the native ISO, so we're we're shooting usually around ISO anywhere between two hundred and eight hundred, depending on the picture profile as well, because usually the picture profile might affect the lowest ISO value that we can actually use. Um, and if we want uh, a bit of a shallower depth of field. So great, we figured out the values that we want, but what we're going to find out is that basically if we're shooting with these values, during midday, especially here in Malta, where it's usually quite sunny um, and it's always the sun is always reflecting off buildings. The scene itself is going to be too bright. And uh, this is where the ND filter comes in handy because this will be the fourth element um, of what allows you to basically keep these values uh, whilst called controlling your exposure. So it will help you basically keep stick to these values. Um, so basically the values that you've picked will be based on whatever it is that, that you have in mind of shooting, um, but it will also help you to dial down this, this exposure. Uh, so in this case, we're seeing two different types of, of, of ND filters. One of the first one is a screw on filter, variable filter, and the second one is fixed uh, and it's more of a video based, uh, video oriented feature. So focus. So basically, just like in photography, in, in video, you've got both autofocus and manual focus. Um, when we're discussing autofocus, uh, it's important to mention that the last couple of the, the, the recent bodies video, uh, the, the recent cameras actually have become quite good um, in terms of autofocus performance when it comes to video because older camera bodies uh, didn't have uh, uh, autofocus performance, which was as good in video. And when I when I mention not as good, I mean that it usually uh, hunts, says hunting within the shot, within the shot itself. So you'll see your frame going in and out of focus, which obviously isn't something that you want. Um, the reason why we're saying that focus is important is that, especially if you're shooting at a shallower depth of field, uh, and with larger resolutions coming into play in this day and age. So for example, if you're shooting in 4K, this means that critical focus is even more important because the end result will be even more noticeable, basically. Um, so yeah, so autofocus or manual focus. So most of the time, uh, this really depends on what it is that you're shooting. Uh, most of the time when you will see, when, when we're discussing video, most people prefer shooting in manual focus because they want to regain, retain full control of the focus uh, and they don't want the camera making that those sort of choices uh, for them. Um, although, as I was saying beforehand, the late, some of the latest cameras have become quite good um, with, with autofocus, with certain features, for example, face and eye recognition as well. So you still be able to, to get good video as well with that. Um, when we're dealing with, with manual focus, there are certain, just like we're discussing, fo uh, exposure tools, which were tools which helps us gain good exposure. There are tools as well, we call them focus aids, that help us uh, figure out what's in focus actually, because sometimes it can be quite hard to understand what's actually in focus when, when you're seeing uh, the, the shots on the camera's small screen or viewfinder. And one of these most most common options, one of these most common aids 
is peaking. So basically, usually you select a color. Most of the times it's red, but it's usually customizable, as we're seeing in the first shot. Um, and it will basically light up in red the edges that are basically in focus. So it will help you figure out where exactly it is that's in focus. Um, another feature that I want to mention is the use of the AF1 button, which is found on most uh, DSLR cameras, bodies on the backside. Um, and I, I've included this because I want to mention that even if the camera that you're using might be a bit older um, and might not have the best autofocus performance when it comes to video, uh, you could actually set the AF1 button up in a way that it actually toggles uh, whether the camera is actually is actually focusing or not. Um, and so it does, it, it basically pauses or resumes the continuous focus. So basically what, we let, what this allows you to do is basically using your camera's autofocus mode, but before you're actually shooting uh, and for the duration of, of the shot, you can actually just press the button and locking the focus in place, unless obviously something will, will actually, you want to actually change focus during the shot itself. But if you're shooting something which is a fixed scene, it might be helpful because it will help you gain focus and just lock it for the duration of the, of the shot. So camera movement. So in video, obviously, we're seeing this, this movement within, we can have this movement within the shot itself. So it's not just about uh, just having something which is still. Um, camera movement isn't simply about making a shot look better in terms of aesthetics, but it also has, it has a function. And uh, I think the function is that it actually directs, it can be used to direct the viewer's attention. And there are different tools um, and equipment that can be used to, to, to create this motion. Um, so from this, it could, it could be from something as simple as, as a tripod and using the tripods panning and tilting, um, to the frame the shot, um, or it could be something more complex as we're seeing here. So it could be a slider, which will give you, uh, this, this smooth horizontal movement, um, or for example, a gimbal, uh, which is basically the one on the, on the, the second shot. Uh, which will allow you to, to move with the camera and give you smooth movement so you don't get bumpy footage. Um, when we're discussing movement as well, I think it's important to, to mention that nowadays most cameras have some sort of internal stabilization in, in body stabilization, IBIS, um, and this is particularly handful uh, when we're shooting handheld video because it helps us achieve smoother shots, basically. So, so that's something which is quite important, especially if we're shooting, if we're using prime lenses, which usually don't have uh, internal stabilization. So that's something which can be quite helpful when it comes to video, perhaps even more so than photography. So B-roll, B-roll, it's uh, it mostly relates to using, getting additional shots which can be used basically throughout our video. So it's not simply about just having uh, random shots which just look cool, but it can be used uh, to, to carefully have selected shots which immer immerse the viewer and help us drive the, the story forwards. Um, and this is basically just another layer of depth to our story, to our video story. So just to give you a clearer example of, of what we're saying when we're mentioning B-roll is that, let's say in this case, we have our main sequence, which involves um, a two camera setup during an interview. Um, so we have a mid shot and a more of a close up shot. Um, so our main sequence, our main story is basically cutting between these two shots. So, B-roll, the, the shots, the four shots that you're seeing at, uh, on the top are considered as B-roll footage because we can use these shots to supplement our main sequence. So basically, these will be overlaid throughout the video accordingly. 
the import and the advantages basically of using this sort of footage, B-roll footage, is that for the most part, it actually increases the video's production value. So have, because it allows us to capture more creative shots, usually as we're seeing here. But it's not just about aesthetics, as we were saying beforehand. It also gives more context. So if you say, if you're just seeing um, the, the shots at the bottom, our main sequence of just some guy standing there um, and speaking, you might not get context unless you're hearing what he's actually saying. But if you're seeing him working in his office space as well, so you know that he's discussing something related to his workplace. Um, so it, it is actually giving you context. It is also important to pick shots that actually reinforce your main storyline. So, for example, just to give you a bit of a, of a better understanding of what I'm saying here is that, for example, if we look at the fourth shot, uh, B-roll, this was actually the end shot. So we're seeing a silhouette of the guy. Um, and in this case, there was a bit of movement and I was just basically moving closer to the window and seeing more this, this view. And what it's basically signifying is that visually this is portraying, hey, we're ending the video on a positive note and we're seeing what, what lies ahead in the future, basically, because it was tying in to something that uh, the, the presenter was actually saying. So in this case, we've got a visual representation of what was actually being mentioned in the video itself. And just for the 10 gigs, basically, this is what's what the sequence will actually look like, look like uh, the timeline uh, in an editing application. So lighting, the main difference without delving too much into lighting when it comes to video will be that unlike photography, Whereas in photography, when you're dealing with artificial lighting, you're using strobes. In video, we're obviously dealing with just continuous lighting. Um, and uh, one of the key differences behind this is that it's usually not as powerful as, as strobes themselves. Uh, so if you want to, to balance out, let's say you're shooting an interview setup similar to what we were seeing beforehand, in order to actually shoot and have a window visible in the back, especially if it's during, during the day, you're going to need some pretty powerful lighting in order to match the, the outside. Um, whereas if you were shooting with strobes, with flashes, um, it would have been much easier to achieve that balance because of that. Um, and lighting is it's another factor that will help the audience direct the audience on where to actually look within within the shot itself, basically. So that's one of the things why it's important, apart from the fact from helping us achieve a visual mood. Um, it's important to mention the general difference between using natural light and artificial light. Um, and this is basically the same as in photography. Uh, but one thing that I want to point out is the use of white balance. So just like in photography, white balance also applies uh, and it's even more important when it comes to video because, and this relates back to the fact that we're using compressed formats, basically. So unlike in photography, when you're shooting in RAW and you have the flexibility of changing white balance in post, when it comes to video, you don't have that flexibility uh, for the most part. And it, made, it might be even harder to, to create uh, to, to correct actually the image if it was shot in an incorrect white balance. So it's even more important to identify a good white balance based on what we're shooting and the lighting conditions that we're shooting under. Most cameras have auto white balance as well. Um, and in photography, it could be useful because it will be obviously logged in shot, but just like we were saying with exposure, and with, with focus as well, it might be worth considering locking it off, basically, or just sticking to, to one of the figs, um, um, white balance modes, simply because if you just, especially if the scene contains any sort of motion or if you're shifting the camera's position, you might see that the camera will actually change white balance in shots, and that will make things quite complicated because first it looks very unprofessional and unnatural, um, and it's also quite hard to correct, whereas if you just had to have a simple correction, 
uh, of let's say you want to to shift more towards uh, green or magenta, for example. But if if using the white balance change in short, that's quite hard to achieve and to to counteract afterwards. Um, we're basically uh, just some other things that I want to mention as well is that the same tools that basically apply to photography, whether that's diffusion and gels, also applies to videos as to video as well, and that will actually actually help us shape sort of our light um, and get different colors as well, based on what we're shooting, as we're seeing here basically. So here's like a different. I've included some shots of different lighting scenarios, um, which is ranging basically from natural and artificial daylight to to artificial light, basically. So audio, audio, I think it's one of the second uh, key differences from shooting stills as well, because obviously when you're shooting stills, you don't have to capture audio. Um, and one one of my favorite film directors, George Lucas, once mentioned. Uh, this this good quote that basically he was saying that sound is actually half the picture. Um, so what this actually means is that basically you could have the best looking visuals video in terms of video, uh, but if your sound doesn't sound as good, if your audio doesn't sound as good, um, you you still the audience will still not be satisfied with what they're watching and will sort of push them back rather than helping them delve into the story. Um, when we're dealing with audio, usually we we have three different stems. We're dealing with three different stems. We call them stems. So we have uh, dialogue, we have sound effects, and we have music. So these are sort of different categories of audio that will all contribute to one final audio track for the for the video itself. Obviously whatever it is, it depends on what you're shooting. So you might have all of the above, you might have a combination of all of these, or you could have simply music, but it all boils down to what, whatever it is that you're actually capturing. Um, speaking of music, um, I, I'd like to actually point out here that because for the most part, we're using content created by other content creators and artists, um, licensing comes into play. Just like we don't like um, having other people uh, stealing our work when it comes to images, the same applies to, to music. So it, it's important rather than just using commercial tracks, it's important to license music. Um, and nowadays there are several platforms which, which allow you to do this easily, um, including Musicbed or Artlist, just to mention a few, and this will give you quite quite a good collection usually, especially if, if you're going for something which is subscription based, which if you're shooting many video projects, you might want to explore as well. Although you'll obviously find other platforms which offer licensing per track, which might be better off for one of projects. So when it comes to audio, if we're capturing audio, obviously, as we were saying beforehand, capturing good audio is crucial especially if our video will be dialogue driven basically so if we're capturing for example an interview we want to make sure that the video itself doesn't just look good in terms of shots but also we want to make sure that we're capturing the best audio that we can uh, and and this all boils down to mostly not just the equipment that you're using to capture the audio so different microphones uh, but also um, the environment in which you're shooting. So this is something to keep in mind as well, uh, because it will help you determine sort of the level of background noise that there is as well. Um, so you're going to have different microphones. The most common types of microphones will be either lapel microphones, which you can pin usually to, to persons. Um, so for example, for the interviews, that, that comes in quite handy. Or you could have a shotgun microphone, uh, which is placed more uh, from a distance out of shot, and it's it's capturing directional sounds. Um, the benefit of of lapel is that they help uh, because they can be closer to the source, to the person that's actually speaking. They help capture. Excuse me. They help capture basically cleaner audio, whereas the shotgun microphone 
and any other similar microphones will pick up more room noise, sort of, of what's happening around us, the surroundings. Um, in this case, I've included this this picture. Basically, it's showing that certain cameras, and this is this again boils down to what makes different cameras and why why it's important to choose the right camera for the job. So in this case, I'm using a, a more of a cinema camera, uh, Canon C300 in this case. Um, and one of the features that it has is that it it, it includes um, specific audio inputs that normal DSLR or mirrorless cameras don't have. So in this case, I'm actually recording audio from two different sources. I'm recording both through the shotgun mic, which is visible on the backside on a boom pole, um, as well as through a transmitter, a wireless lapel, basically. So I can capture both of these in camera at the same time. Now, one thing I want to mention as well is that if you just if you just have a normal DSLR or mirrorless, um, and you're gonna be finding that you might want to inc to to capture, for example, an interview, and you're gonna find that your audio options are limited. Instead of just forking out a ton of money on just buying a newer camera, which allows you to capture this good audio in camera, you might want to explore as well uh, buying a decent audio recorder. So basically, this is a tool which basically just captures audio. It will give you the same inputs, which is usually found on higher end cameras. Uh, and uh, it's usually relatively cheap as well, especially if you if you want something basic. Um, so it, the price usually varies depending on, on your requirements uh, and the amount of inputs that you need, et cetera, basically. So editing, just jumping a bit into the different editing applications that there are when you're shooting video. Um, the most common ones I would say are on Mac OS. You've got iMovie, you've got Final Cut. Uh, Final Cut is basically a beefier version of iMovie. Um, you've also got Adobe Premiere and DaVinci Resolve. Um, DaVinci Resolve has become quite common nowadays uh, because of the features that Blackmagic keep adding year in, year out, uh, but also because of the fact that they offer a very good, actually, free version. Uh, they do offer a paid studio version as well, uh, but it has obviously certain, uh, it's only meant basically for professional purpose, uh, and the, the limitations uh, won't really restrict you when you're using the free version. On Windows, you're going to find that basically some of these are also common to Windows, so both Premiere and Resolve are common in Windows as well. Uh, and you also have, I've also included Sony Vegas, uh, which some, some users uh, explore, especially if you're still new to the world of, of video as well. Um, most of these nowadays have quite similar interfaces uh, and workflows, so it doesn't really matter whichever it is that you pick. Uh, personally, I work on Final Cut, uh, but I only do so for the simple fact that I've just become used to the workflow that 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 entails. Um, so that's just boils down to personal preference. Um, so speaking of workflow, uh, I just want to run briefly to what's what's involved. Uh, basically, once you have the video captured. Uh, and in order to make it, to transform it into the finished product. So these are the steps involved, basically. So first, you have to import the footage um, and basically choosing your shots, culling the footage. Um, and this is done in a way, basically, to shape your story. So if we have if we identified one main sequence. So if we're saying, let's say we're shooting an interview, that's going to be our main sequence, our main storyline. Then we're going to start adding B-roll, as we we're saying, shots which help drive the story forward. So let's say we we start including some establishing shots of where the story is taking place, um, the time of day. Um, again, who's involved, more shots of the location, uh, and these are all shots which can be used throughout the video itself. Once we have the edit logged, uh, we want to jump into the coloring stage. Now, coloring usually is split into two when it comes to video. Um, so you've got the first part is color correction. 
So you want to iron out any tweaks when it comes to exposure. Uh, so if the image is a bit dark, you want to, to lighten it a bit. Um, or if you want to tweak your white balance. Um, so so that's, that's color correction. Uh, but also then there's the creative grade. So grading basically involves giving the film more of a stylized look. Um, you might hear as well people mentioning LUTs, uh, basically referring to lookup tables. And these are just basically files that can be applied and giving you looks basically similar uh, to, to presets in, in, in photography editing applications as well, uh, because the process itself is quite similar as well. Uh, then, obviously, the key difference is audio, mixing audio. So as we're discussing, we have three different stems. So we want to make sure that uh, whatever audio stems we have, whether it's dialogue, music, or sound effects, uh, we're including these and make sure, making sure that they're properly mixed. Uh, and by that, I mean, so for example, if you want both dialogue and music, you don't end up with music that's actually overpowering uh, the overpowering the dialogue itself in such a way that the audience won't be able to understand what's actually being said. Once you've got your film ready, it's time to obviously export basically the film itself. Uh, and you know that, that that will allow you to basically export a finished video file in order to be uploaded and delivered wherever it is that you want to, to put the finished product. Back up before concluding, I I did want to, to mention backups because of how important this obviously is. And in this case, this relates, I think this is something that relates to both photography as well as video. So we're dealing when we're dealing because we're dealing with files with what us data is everything. So we want to make sure that, especially in video, uh, we want to make sure that we've ingested, basically copied all our media properly and safely before starting our edit. edit. Um, so if we want the ideally, so once you've copied your footage from the card onto your hard drive, the client import them in importing them into your editing application, just to make sure that you've basically copied all your files um, and there is no corrupted files basically. Um, and there's also the three to one rule that I want to mention as well when it comes to, to backups. So basically the three to one rule suggest that we should have three copies of the data ideally. So one primary and two backups. We should have two different media. So this should be stored in two different media. So whether that's local hard drives or a network that edge storage, for example. And the one refers to having one copy of site. So in case um, of, for example, a physical theft or a fire, it's useless having three physical copies located in the same location, in the same room or next to each other because they could all be lost at once and you're still gonna end up basically screwed unless you have copies of site somewhere else. So that basically brings us to a conclusion. 